first panel discussion for day three at TSS 2021 is on a pertinent topic that has rightfully gathered great momentum for ambitious startups and patient investors all across the globe. We're here to discuss the topic, impact investing here to stay. You know, impact investments are investments made with the intention to generate positive, measurable social and environmental impact alongside a financial return. Let's soak in all this and more from our panelists today. To welcome our panelists, I'd like to invite Mr. Bhanu Prakash to do the needful. Over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of us. Uh, and welcome to the Thai Sustainability Summit. On behalf of uh, Thai Hyderabad, I welcome you all. Uh, very happy to see uh, today we have a very impactful session on impact investing here to stay. Uh, here I welcome uh, Mr. Vinit Roy from the Avishkar Group and also our moderator, uh, Mr. Uh, Prashant Manier. Uh, Prashant Manier, uh, hi to all of you. Good morning. Good afternoon again to all of you. Prashant Manier is actually uh, is a managing partner at Instituto Advisors LLP. Institute Advisors is an award-winning boutique and working on many acquisitions, uh, you know, joint ventures, partnerships, alliances, you know, India's entry strategy for the global majors. He has done many things and uh, awesome personality here. Uh, going to talk about this uh, impact investing. Over to you, Prashant. Please go ahead and take it forward. Yep, Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, uh, Banu and uh, Vinny. Good morning and uh, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for uh, taking time to be with us today and uh, talk about uh, impact investing um, for our audience. Good morning, good afternoon, and I hope uh, good evening to se several of you in the uh, uh, West. And uh, to just give a quick introduction on Vinit. Actually, Vinit, uh, to those who are in the impact investing world or working on sustainability companies, Vinit actually requires very little introduction. I mean, he is the guru and legend in impact investing uh, globally. Um, Avishkar Group is a, a company that he founded, which uh, houses uh, several entities, right from NBFCs to uh, investing equity capital to uh, operating companies. And so, um, you know, he's got tons and tons of experience in this space. Um, at Avishkar Capital, I believe uh, they have raised, uh, uh, they have $1.25 billion uh, uh, of assets under management. And they're raising their next 250 million as an India fund, which we'll also talk about uh, during our uh, conversation. So, you know, uh, Vineet, welcome. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Prashant. And thank you <clears throat> to Ty for inviting me for the session. Thank you so much. Super. So, you know, um, why don't we just directly get into it? I mean, this is a, a, a masterclass format and uh, we need, you know, I will uh, pose several questions to you and then, you know, uh, we'll take the conversation from that. Uh, forward from there. So the first thing I want to start off with, Vinit, is, you know, for our audience especially, is what is impact investing? You know, we all put money into uh, stocks, mutual funds, private investments, and so on and so forth. And um, over the last few years, we've heard this whole thing about impact, 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 and impact investing. So, you know, uh, uh, um, why don't we start from there? And if you can give us some broad idea on what is impact investing, uh, that'll be a great start. I think the person who introduced Banu did uh, give the official definition of impact investing. Uh, but to simplify it, if you, if you have a very strong intent to make impact, uh, you are willing to make that disclosure right up front. And then you are willing to make investments uh, with that intent. And when you say, I'm going to make impact investment or I will make intent intentional investment to make deliver impact, uh, then you have to define what that impact is and you'll have to hold yourself accountable. So if you are able to showcase intentionality by documenting, by disclosing, by writing it in your PPM and then measure it and report it back, uh, then that investment, and remember that investment is termed as impact investment. Now, a lot of people see impact and investment as two different terms, but impact investing is actually about, uh, is a single term impact investment. Uh, and you don't actually disaggregate them. So this is one single word. And the idea behind this is uh, the, and, and I'll actually try to, uh, because a lot of people in the audience might be thinking that uh, are there investments that don't make impact? Uh, and uh, it's very difficult to say that any investments uh, these days do not make impact. So if you invest in a telecom company, does it not make, make impact? Well, the answer is yes, it makes huge amount of impact. Uh, do Tata's not make impact? Does Reliance not create jobs? Does Unilever not make impact? 
So does did Apple not make impact? Google not make impact? So what is so unique about impact investment? I think that's really a very obvious and simple question that uh, bothers a lot of people. So let me start by saying that all investments make impact. Some make only positive impact. Some make both positive and negative impact. And some make a lot more negative impact than positive impact. When you are talking about impact investments, uh, you are essentially saying that I will go and make an investment uh, with the intention. Now, when Google was created, the idea was not really to make an impact. Google made a huge amount of impact. Uh, and a lot of companies will make a lot of huge impact, even though there was no intention uh, at their end. However, what happens is it generally helps those who are part of the economic activity. So will Google make a huge difference? It will make a huge difference uh, to normal people who are part of the economic activity. But then there is a very large population in the world and world has 7 billion people. We have roughly three, three and a half billion people who are on the margins of economic activity or outside the margins of economic activity. And these people will not get impacted as much as we want them to be by any of the innovations taking place in the mainstream economy. And that's where impact investors try to extend the boundaries of economic uh, inclusion so that those people who are being left out also benefit from the Airtels, the Bharatis, the Geos, the Googles and the Apples. So very simply put, impact investing is an intentional activity to generate, to bring significant part of the humanity left out of the economic activity into the mainstream. That's a great, great definition. And uh, we appreciate some of the examples you've given. Could you deep, uh, uh, dive a little bit deeper into what is this impact? You no, know, we've talked, uh, you've talked a little bit about social and, you know, et cetera. But if you can just deep uh, dive a little bit deeper into it, what is impact, right? What examples of what are different types of impact investments? So uh, see when you, uh, so let's, let's take what is, why is Avishkar, let's say different from us, from any other fund, let's say any, any venture capital fund. So does Avishkar take risk? Answer is yes. Uh, well, so does Sequoia and Axel and anybody else who is actually in the venture capital space. But in, when you are investing in venture capital, what kind of risk are you taking? First, you choose a very evolved ecosystem. So where do you invest? You invest in Bangalore, you invest in Chennai, you invest in Silicon Valley. And why do you invest there? Because there is a very evolved ecosystem. And what is an ecosystem? An ecosystem is where talent, capital, uh, liquidity, and uh, academic support, everything else is standing next to each other. Mm. There are almost no gaps. And in such cases, you are taking a risk on either a human behavior change uh, potential, but everything else is given, you are still taking a risk because you don't know whether you can take human beings to Mars and keep them alive there. So there is a huge kind of risk and that risk is actually very futuristic. Uh, and that risk you are taking, but not in absence of capital, not in absence of talent, not in absence of anything else. Now think about uh, an investment being made, let's say uh, in Bihar or in UP or in Jharkhand or in Orissa, in back of beyond uh, where there are no ecosystems. Hmm? There is basic infrastructure is questionable. Uh, quality of manpower that is available generally would want to migrate to Mumbai, Delhi, etc. How many times have you heard of people trying to migrate back to Banaras or Patna or Samastipur for that matter? So if I go and take a risk by investing in Bihar, what am I trying to do? I am trying to create a company that will create jobs and livelihoods where people live. Because you know very well, Prashant, uh, you live in Mumbai, that we just don't have space to have more people coming in. So you have to take companies and jobs where people live so that they don't move uh, people to this. The other part is a lot of these people who are actually migrating from UP, Bihar and others, they are the talent of that place. If they are going to migrate to Mumbai, then what kind of quality of talent will be left and how do you actually create industries, entrepreneurs, etc. in those societies? So when you go and try to make an investment in Bihar, what you are trying to do, or UP for that matter, or Jharkhand, you are trying to build a company there that will create jobs and livelihoods there. But not only jobs and livelihoods, create a business that actually creates, a, makes sure a significant amount of the turnover of that company is recycled in that economy. And I'll pick up a very simple example. Let's pick up the state of Odisha. Odisha. Uh, Odisha, uh, there is a company called Milk Mantra. Uh, it's actually a fairly famous company. Uh, Milk Mantra was actually uh, conceptualized and started in 2010. We started engaging with the founder, Shri Kumar Mishra, from 2009. 
Uh, and uh, we convinced Shri Kumar that you should actually go to Orissa and start a dairy. Now, Orissa, Odisha by nature is actually a, uh, by, uh, it, it's a milk deficit state. It's not a state where logically somebody would like to start a dairy. So dairy generally will be west in uh, south of India, uh, but you will not want to go and start a dairy in Odisha because local supply of milk is not there. We saw that as an invitation to go and start a company because it is not about the dairy because everybody will say, but dairy requires milk and you don't have milk. How will you run a dairy? To get the milk, you have to create a decentralized uh, operation where you go and convince a microfinance institution to lend to people so that they can buy cows and their cow's milk then actually will be poured into local chilling centers that you will as an enterprise build. And those chilling centers will then provide you uh, uh, milk, which you can then sell into the local urban centers like Katak, Bhuneshwar, Sambalpur, etc. Now, in this process, on a thumb rule basis, let's say today the turnover of milk mantra will be close to 300 crores. Roughly 200 crores goes into the local 200 kilometer vicinity of Gok, where this plant is based. Now, imagine 200 crores on an annual basis growing by 30% continuously going into the local rural uh, area. What kind of uh, income change it will do into a state that is actually at the bottom of India's growth rate? Now, that's really an example. Was it a path breaking, um, sending people to Mars kind of an initiative? Answer is no. Was it as risky? Answer is yes, because there is no milk and you are still taking a very high risk to bring about a significant change. Is it profitable? We have taken this company from zero to 350 crores and generally companies are actually valued between one to 1.5 times or two times of their revenues. So what you have done is you have built hundred million dollars of 75 to hundred million dollars value worth of value by investing, let's say one seventh of that amount. Some of us will make five, six, seven X returns. But the time taken to generate the return is very long. So we have taken eight to 10 years. In the process, you have created 50,000 to 100,000 farmers who have actually generated a significant amount of continuous income. And you have created a vibrant local economy and an ecosystem. More importantly, you have created a role model for Odisha to look up to and create entrepreneurship there. Um, Vinny, that's uh, that's phenomenal. I mean, you've touched upon so many points that I actually want to discuss uh, during the course of uh, uh, our discussion. But just continuing on this uh, exact theme of uh, what is impact investing, um, you know, we've heard so much about now ESG uh, uh, investing as well, right? There are funds which are saying, look, we are an ESG oriented fund, etc. And, uh, you know, actually broadly speaking everybody sort of buckets everything into uh, one right so it's environmental social governance impact sustainability clean energy clean tech whatever so um are these one and the same or are these different or if there are differences what are those so i think uh, see esg is actually a nomenclature it's a framework uh, and esg as a framework can be applied to any company so it can be applied to reliance it can be applied to tatas it can be applied to a startup as well uh, so what is ESG? It's environment, social and governance. And what you basically look at is you look at, you try, try to classify the risk a company mm -hmm. is going to deliver into certain buckets. So what kind of environmental risk this company is going to create? What kind of governance uh, management systems they have put in place? Does it actually adheres and follows the governance uh, philosophies that have been enshrined in ESG? Uh, what kind of engagement does this company have with the society, with its employees, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is what ESG is. So ESG is really about going and evaluating a company and seeing what parameters and performance does it actually meet. It's a framework that can be applied. Impact investment, on the other hand, is a screen, which means you are first making a commitment upfront, and then you are actually saying that, hey, any investment I will make will meet these criteria that I have laid out. Now, this is actually a huge difference. So impact investing, ESG is actually a continuous process. And it is actually, so when you do, when you go through, when you say, I am going to adapt ESG, you essentially say, I'm going to make myself open to an evaluation of the kind of risk that I'm generating. And I'm going to offer a corrective plan to correct myself, to adhere to those norms. And I'll keep making those disclosures. On the impact, you say, I am going to start a company to make this difference and I will report it and I will raise capital on those terms as well. 
So as an investor, I cannot invest in a company uh, which is actually saying I will adopt ESG, but as an investor, I have to find a company that meets the criteria for which I'm going to invest capital. So impact investing is actually putting capital uh, into a company and ESG and there are fund. For example, Avishkar is thinking of launching a fund called ESG First that will be operating for Asia and Africa, where we will go and look at a company and say, okay, what is your ESG framework? Do you have ESG framework? And can we help you improve your ESG framework so that you actually are more compliant rather than less compliant? Because in ESG, you can be in A, B, C, any category of risk, and you can move towards a C category of risk over a period of time. In impact, the condition is right up front. You cannot be invested if you don't meet my conditions. Uh, that's a great distinction. And, you know, if I have to think just about summarizing that sort of impact is like a, a commitment or a goal that this is what we are going to do. And ESG essentially gives you the tools to see how close you come to that or, you know, how far are you from that and how you get closer to those, uh, those goals. Would that be a fair summarization? Uh, ESG is a framework. It's a very horizontal framework and applies to everyone uh, to get into the impact. Impact is a very small subset where you actually say, I'm going to invest and create companies that are impactful from day one. Now, when I say subset, it does not necessarily mean that it will remain a subset. The entrepreneurial expectation of impact investing, and by the way, I personally go way beyond or way before impact investing. So we did not start to actually create a small subset of investors. We wanted to change the world of investing where every investor asks this question, is my capital while generating return, creating a more equitable, sustainable and livable world? And I think that's the aspiration with which we have started. So sooner or later, we expect to convert everybody, the $400 trillion of global capital into impact investing. That's a, that's a great segue for me as well, Vineet. Uh, you talked about what you started out doing and what you want to do. So, you know, uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about your journey. Um, as you said, and, you know, as we have known, you've been uh, uh, doing impact investing before there was something like impact investing. And you've been involved in this for, you know, um, uh, quite a few number of years. And you're amongst the maybe one, two or three people who started this whole uh, journey in the world. So maybe you can take walk us back uh, to that point and, you know, talk about, you know, uh, uh, how did this journey come about? Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually a forester. I used to live in a forest in Odisha. Uh, and uh, then I got married and my wife actually uh, probably didn't like the forest as much as I did. And so I moved to IIM Ahmedabad to do a little bit of research. And then I set up probably, probably, I'm not so sure if it was the first, but probably India's first incubator. Uh, for government of Gujarat, ran it for four years. My job was to convert farmer's idea into businesses. And it is during that period I realized it is not, the problem is not with the idea. The problem is with the risk capital and availability of talent. So if you are actually going to make a difference to the lives of the farmers, you have to provide, you have to provide a significant amount of risk capital that you can lose in case you fail. Uh, and at the same time, you have to convince talent to work with those capital. Uh, so I quit my job in 2001 and with uh, roughly 5,000 rupees at that point of time, $100 in capital, I started myself and then borrowed $2,000 from my wife to start a company called IntelliCap. So the $100 helped me set up Avishkar, which was a venture capital fund. The idea was this venture capital fund will raise money like any other venture capital fund, but it will invest in uh, ideas of people that would create jobs, livelihoods, reduce risk and vulnerabilities. Uh, and as I used to define at that point of time, make poor people rich. Uh, I was very naive. I was 29. I had no experience. So I came up with a very ambitious idea. Can you make poor people rich? Uh, of course, later I defined, redefined the meaning of rich as not necessarily Mr. Ambani or Mr. Adani. To me, a person is rich once you can meet, uh, once you can eat two square meals a day, you can send your children to school. Uh, you can actually have a, a roof on the on your head. And you can save your family from the risks of the elements. So if you can actually take somebody to that stage from where they are, which is very vulnerable, very exposed, no income, hunger, hunger, poverty, etc. Then after that, it is a game of choices. Uh, once you have made choices available to a person uh, of quality of living, then after that, rich is, uh, the person is already rich. And after that, you can become as rich as you want. So for us, richness was defined as uh, creating choices for the people. 
And uh, one way to create choices, I realized, is to create businesses that create jobs and livelihoods for people where they live or reduce risk and vulnerabilities in their lives. And that's what became our defining feature of Avishka, that we, every investment we make, we ask, do you create jobs and livelihoods for people who live somewhere else uh, where they are actually don't have jobs and livelihoods? Or do you reduce risk and vulnerabilities in their life, for example? Now, you asked about climate and clean energy. Now, I have been doing investing for 20 years, and I realized that climate change is one biggest uh, destroyer of all the work that we do. Uh, because we create jobs and livelihoods, then there is a thunderstorm, there is a cyclone, there is actually a flood, there is a drought, and that actually destroys a significant amount of jobs and livelihoods. And therefore, investing and making a difference to the climate is also making a huge difference to the idea of impact investing. And therefore, impact investing is also a very broad bucket. And my personal uh, ambition has lied since then, 2001, has been how do you create an entire ecosystem uh, to nurture these entrepreneurs, provide them support, uh, engage the community in their businesses. And doing all this uh, in broken ecosystems while generating returns. So the most important thing is you have to generate return and return capital. Uh, and we have held ourselves accountable to that. Uh, uh, and uh, it's been a difficult journey. Uh, the term impact investing got coined somewhere in 2008. Some of us got together in Italy uh, under uh, Rockefeller has foundation as a beautiful Rockefeller center there uh, next to Lake Como and uh, some of us. And we basically were to choose a name of how we call ourselves. And we came up with the term impact investing and Rockefeller invested in Avishkar uh, as part of their commitment to impact investing in 2009. So I think, uh, long story short, I predated the term impact investing by seven, eight years. I had two co-fellers, uh, two co-travelers at that point of time. There were others who were already, already investing in microfinance. There is Theodos, uh, which has been investing in microfinance much before we came onto the scene in 2001. So they were doing it probably in early 90s or mid 90s. Uh, but uh, the great idea has been that in 2001, uh, Ronnie Cohen started in Bridges Ventures in US, uh, in UK. Jacqueline Novograd started Acumen and I started Avishkar. And we all started without knowing each other. Of course, we became friends over a period of time, but uh, we started differently. We also started with very different objectives. Uh, at Avishkar, we wanted to actually raise capital to make an impact and return capital. That's basically was the... I did not know what kind of returns we'll generate, but we wanted to deliver uh, some return. Uh, Jacqueline started by saying, uh, this is an area where you require philanthropy to play a role. And uh, Bridges Ventures started that commercial returns are a must. And uh, we have followed our paths and our journeys similarly. Uh, and I, you can understand uh, this was UK, so you can actually, it's a very developed economy, so you can make those kind of investments. Setting up a, a, a hotel in a difficult geography was impact investing. In India, it's very different. Uh, and for Jacqueline sitting in US and trying to invest in India, Pakistan, Kenya, uh, it was very different. So uh, that's great. So you know, um, from two thousand nine to now, you know, two thousand twenty one. What has that journey involved? And you know, how has sort of the the notion of impact investing, you know, uh, evolved over that time? Uh, you know, as a lot of things have changed, right? I mean, 2008, we had the great meltdown, you know, uh, financial crisis, you know, recently we had COVID. So, you know, just walk us through how that has evolved, what has been sort of Avishkar's uh, role and focus uh, in those, etc. You know, just give us that background, please. So I think uh, uh, impact investing now has come a long distance. I mean, for much farther than any of us ever thought uh, there will be so such a big acceptance of Impact investing. If I go by the latest uh, uh, numbers that I have, I think impact investing is closing on to a trillion dollar of assets under management. Uh, not necessarily, we have not hit the trillion dollar mark, but we are pretty close, somewhere between 750 billion to a trillion dollar. Mm, and this is actually quite extraordinary. Uh, what we realized in 2008 uh, when we came up with the name impact investing is how do you convince the mainstream to move mm -hmm. impact investing? And at that point of time, uh, uh, some wisdom uh, that came through largely coming from people who were coming from investing background, not from me, uh, was that there has to be uh, what you call a line that investors must have. And that line should say that the allocation will take place to impact investing. 
Uh, mm. Really what you do is when you are a large pension fund or a large investor or an endowment or anybody else, uh, the way capital is allocated is uh, there has to be a place for the allocation. So there will be real assets, there will be uh, country specific limits, there would actually be emerging markets, there would be venture capital, there will be private equity. Uh, you have to find a place in that list. That requires a significant amount of public education and that requires a policy advocacy body. So uh, collectively, the impact investors of that, of your, the, those who started, including me, uh, we decided to set up a public policy uh, or policy advocacy body called Global Impact Investing Network. And Avishkar was a party to it. If you go to Jin's, uh, uh, Jin's platform and look at the first interview, I think the first interview of their website still continues to be mine. Now, uh, the same policy advocacy we brought to India by setting up India Impact Industry Council a little later, four or five years, as we started seeing the value of what Jin was doing. So Jin has done quite a remarkable job of creating uh, a, a policy advocacy, a policy lobbying body for impact investing. And today, therefore, there is a significant amount of attention from those who own capital. Remember, people like us, we were going from the bottom up. We were actually working closer to the communities that are impacted, but we were not sitting in the pools of capital. And therefore, you needed to bridge, create this bridge. Impact investing coming in as an allocation line within almost all endowments uh, and uh, pension funds, etc., has been the major victory uh, for the global policy advocacy. Uh, and a lot of people have contributed to those, those who have actually generated significant returns and those who have generated significant impact. Uh, now, uh, there is a whole continuum of impact investing. There is an impact investing that just comes with philanthropy first or charity first or uh, coming with no returns or low returns. And then there is an impact investing which says, I want to deliver full returns. Uh, and then there are a whole host of activities in between. Uh, I think uh, a lot of credit for popularization of impact investing will go to those who has focused on return first, significant amount of returns. But uh, a lot of credibility of impact investing, uh, when I say credibility that you make impact has come from those who have actually tried to balance the returns with impact. Uh, is the impact investing tent very wide? The answer is yes. Uh, is impact investing, uh, is there something called impact washing going on? The answer is yes. Uh, Am I actually perturbed by that? Not so much because I understand and I know that whenever a system actually starts integrating the whole world, there will be some level of dilution. And that's what, what people euphemistically call mainstreaming. Having said that, uh, my general belief is as more and more capital will go, more eyes will be on impact investing and therefore more accountability will be sought on the term impact from impact investors. And I therefore am a great, greatly hopeful of the future of impact investing, that it will make mistakes, but it will be held accountable and therefore has a huge chance of making a big difference to the uh, future of the world. Uh, that's great. I mean, it sounds like that, uh, uh, you know, more and more funds are making allocations. I mean, I was looking at UNPRI. Um, and they've said that, you know, as of March 2021, 700 billion uh, OM has been sort of, you know, allocated to sort of sustainability. And you know, I use that as a broader bucket, uh, which, you know, also includes uh, uh, impact. And I'm sure this is one study, there are more. And as you indicated, you know, close to three quarters of a billion is already uh, allocated to impact. So I think that's a, that's a very promising uh, 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 situation. Uh, for entrepreneurs as well as investors um, as so much capital is getting committed because you know at some point we'll hit uh, hopefully an in, you know sort of an inflection point which uh, just makes this whole thing uh, skyrocket so i think that's that's a very very promising um, uh, situation but um, you sort of alluded to one more point which i really want to get into um, there is obviously a huge debate going on about you know returns you know historically it was people versus profit you know then there was a triple bottom line benefit and a lot of different you know sort of nomenclatures words etc came in and there is still this the whole tug of war or push and pull between sort of impact and returns um how how is that evolving how uh, that's my first point you know how is that debate evolved where is it at today and how does um, avishkar balance that and uh, make it happen so i think uh... First, we have to be very clear. We are talking about investing. So investing is the broad bucket. Uh, impact investing is part of investing. And what we are trying to do is trying to influence investing. So we are a little baby trying to invest the big daddy uh, to say that what the baby does is actually what you should follow and I should not be following you. 
so it's actually a counter intuitive thought process that's actually what my uh, teenager also tells me yeah so and the world actually sees this on a daily basis because old people uh, have to give way to younger leadership and impact investing is the future of investing and that's why i keep saying that having said that i think uh, the first thing that we need to recognize is we are investment and every investment requires to give some kind of return now what is return uh, is actually a big question uh, so the thought process of last century has been return at all cost they have to deliver return and you have to deliver the highest return because the only thing that matters to the investing world is returning more and more capital uh, you can call it greed you can call it capitalism you can call it past centuries since whatever way you call it this is where it has been focused on now uh, if you look at sustainability just as a term if you go back if the world goes to european standards of uh, of consumption of minerals then world will require two planets to just live on that's essentially the truth uh, so where will you get two earths or three earths it's not possible so the fact of the matter is whatever we did in the last century uh, seems to be not the right way to go that's really the first point of view. now if it is not the right way to go then delivering then greed is not going to let money sustain itself now what is it those who are running sitting with 300 trillion and 400 trillion the global capital pool is 400 trillion let's assume close give take 400 trillion dollars now this 400 trillion dollars is used to growing so you want to go from 400 trillion to 410 420 they are fine growing at a very slow pace 1% 2% 3% but they don't want to give up growing now uh, what if we what did covid do covid actually brought in uh, the risks to this 400 trillion dollar as to uh, what external challenges are we dealing with and those external challenges can bring the entire earth to a standstill that your economic activity can come to a standstill now this can actually happen because of climate change this can happen because 3 billion people on the living on the earth outside the economic activity may combine together in revolt because remember the kind of progress that world is making with technology anything is possible you heard of arab spring there could be a global spring that can take place coming from the rural poor and economic people and they are 3 billion so they are not small now any of those changes can completely disrupt the global economic system and my personal belief is covid has actually taken the fear of survival to 300 trillion and 400 trillion and this would actually repurpose or realign realign the definition of greed what is right return and i think the challenge right now is uh, for example we are in india and every day you hear of a unicorn or a sunicorn now what is yeah. unicorn how does it how does the unicorn come why is unicorn so important it is simply because the term unicorn is driven by greed not necessarily driven by impact is driven by greed because somebody people are now becoming unicorns in one year or some people are going to be born unicorns now now will that actually change anything it is all about capital trying to generate returns but is that sustainable uh, is unicorn a sustainable way to grow is that the right way these are the questions that will come in i am not against unicorn neither i am for unicorn i am just saying it's a very debatable point of view the world has accepted these terms because we continue to chase greed and uh, impact investing is challenging that greed not saying make less returns it is only saying that capital has to ask itself some very relevant questions for itself and the society that what do you want you want a kishm to actually keep growing where poor have to become poorer and rich have to become richer or not and can we therefore sustain and support businesses that actually make the world more sustainable and should the 400 trillion dollars of the global capital significantly go in reducing the shield so that all of us can grow rather than few of us actually become unicorns that's really the debate it's not about whether impact investing should make less returns it should make whatever return it can but it is actually an appeal to the global world to rethink what is sustainable return there are enough people in impact investing who also are chasing greed so i'm not saying that uh, people on the impact investing sides uh, only are chasing impact there are enough people chasing greed as well avishkar right now is focused on very simple things it actually goes and make investments into broken ecosystems to build businesses uh, and none of our businesses are unicorn let me uh, be very honest and say it 
but we have built more profitable business than most people we have built more sustainable business than most people uh, we have still a 70 70 odd percent success rate despite going very early into broken ecosystems and building businesses and we have been profitable and we have returned returns from 5% in one of our funds to 20% in another of our funds. And when you return 20% of the fund, a lot of your companies have given 70, 80 or 90% returns as well. But those returns are coming simply because those companies have built significant sustainable value. And that is the recognition. But we don't get 10,000% returns. We don't have one single company returning five, five times our fund. It doesn't happen with us. Uh, and that is the limitation we bring to the table. So we are not chasing creed. We are chasing uh, to build a sustainable future for your children and their children. And that, I think, is uh, should be appealing enough for the world because COVID has taught us uh, how, how much money you, you collect yourself. But when access, oxygen is not available, you will die. And I think no amount of money can buy you oxygen when you need it and when it is not available. Absolutely. Very well said, uh, Vinita. I really appreciate that thought because, you know, we've faced this all the time, you know, are there going to be unicorns in sustainability? And, you know, uh, our general response that we tend to give and others, you know, like yourself in our community tend to give is, you know, unicorn is a valuation mechanism uh, to look at companies, but what is the real impact in the world that you're actually making? And the cumulative effect of that impact uh, no, there the is, there is, there is much, much greater. Prashant, there is a healthy unicorn also, uh, a unicorn that actually touches 1 billion lives and yeah. makes 1 billion people sustainable uh, or actually creates jobs and livelihoods and reduce risk and vulnerabilities in 1 billion people life is a very worthwhile, worthwhile unicorn. Uh, Absolutely agree. A valuation that is fueled by liquidity is not necessarily sustainable either for those who are chasing unicorns for valuation or for the world. That's the only point we are making. We are not really challenging the idea of unicorn. I'm saying there is a much more worthier unicorn than, than actually just getting a billion dollar valuation. Very well said. And you know, you touched a little bit upon, you know, Avishkar returns. Um, how does that compare to, you know, um, sort of non-impact or other impact uh, uh, returns? I think that'll be an interesting conversation and for our, our audience to kind of understand, um, you know, what, what that comparison looks like broadly, if you, if you can share. So again, Prashant, uh, funds uh, have mandates and those mandates define the kind of returns they will deliver. So one of my funds had the mandate of only significantly investing in low income states. Mm -hmm. Now, just in low income states, uh, other investors, because how do you actually get valuation? You get valuation by somebody else investing in your company, right? And uh, valuation does not necessarily at this point of time actually is a measure of the profitability of your company. So if we invest in Bihar and if we are not able to actually convince other investors to come and give very high valuation to a company that is operating in Bihar or operating out of Bihar, uh, then your valuations or your returns to the investors may not be as attractive. But if you are investing in technology, which is actually creating dating platforms, but you are sitting in Bangalore and because there are a lot of young people there, uh, you will see a fairly fast growth in number of people who are actually using that platform. And that will attract more and more capital because we are sitting in a very evolved ecosystem. Uh, so we have actually, uh, in Avishkar's case, we are just about to return our first fund. We have returned our second fund 2x. Our first fund will be roughly 1.2, 1.3x, so not a great return, but it was a very small fund. So if I actually have to compare anybody who has run a 59 crore fund, uh, raised it for in 2007, uh, you would see that all the mainstream funds of 2007 barely returned capital or returned half of it. I raised an impact fund. I'm a forester and I am actually going to return that fund with some returns. Uh, that will tell you how mainstream and us actually differ on a longer horizon. My second fund, we have returned 2x. Uh, we have already returned 2x. It's a dollar 2x return. Uh, in terms of rupees, it delivered a 12.5% 12, 12 return. In, in terms of dollars, it took a very big dollar hit. So we lost 6% instead of usual 3%. We returned 6.5%, 7% in dollar terms. That's my second fund. My third fund has actually been closed, continuously clocking 20% dollar return, uh, largely because uh, microfinance, which is where financial inclusion, where we invested significantly in that fund, has done quite well. It has scaled up quite big time. And uh, a lot of our companies actually did very well and scaled up. All these companies operate into low-income states uh, in lower strata economic strata. But they have done very well. So, we, so broken ecosystems, if your companies become very large and do very well, you will deliver very large return. Our fourth fund had the mandate of investing largely uh, into low-income states. 
we have created some very successful companies. Some of these companies will, uh, quote unquote, as you call unicorns, may actually become unicorns. They are in agri-tech, uh, in uh, fintech, agri-tech, etc. But this fund is going to take a long time to return 2.53x. And therefore, the returns will be closer to 10, 11% in dollar terms. Remember, I'm talking dollar in some of my, yeah. not, not rupee. Uh, our fifth fund is actually right now in the top quartile of top decile, probably top quartile of uh, uh, the crystal ratings in India. It's an AIF category two fund, and it is actually in the top. Uh, in fact, it, uh, the top the number is 15 point some percent on the net returns basis. We are closer to 18.5 percent uh, on our fifth fund. That will tell you that then all the funds that are, I'm talking about are actually non-impact funds. So our comparison is actually completely non-impact. And so from Abhishkar's perspective, the only thing I can say that uh, we have made 37 exits. Uh, our returns, our gross return MOIC on successful exits is 33%. Our blended return on all exits, good, bad, ugly is 22%. Uh, and that will tell you that uh, impact and returns can go hand in hand. Uh, remember that, and people do forget that we are actually an investor who have created companies, not bought shares in companies. Almost every company Avishkar has invested in, we were either the first investors or we were creators of the companies. Uh, and that actually is a distinction that we are very proud of. Uh, mm -hmm. That really is that every, the impact that we have created on the ground, even after we have exited the company, continues to deliver returns. Uh, that is that is really um, amazing and phenomenal, uh, Vinit. So now you know we've covered so much ground. We are here where we are today. You're raising your next uh, uh, 250 million India fund uh, that you've met, talked about. So what? Tell us a little bit more about that and what do you see as happening as impact investment in the future? Let's look forward. So I, so I think uh, we have talked about the last two decades. Uh, I started with hundred dollars. I told you uh, at the end of 2010 we were managing 28 million dollars. So in my first 10 years, I went from $100 to uh, roughly around uh, $27, $28 million. And then to 2011, we started with uh, $27 million and we went up to $1.2 billion. That's our last 10 years uh, in which we expanded our offering and how we, how we plan to do. Now, the next decade is right on us. Uh, and I'm actually a great believer in the decades. There is a many important reason I believe in decades. 2030 is actually a very important year in human history. Uh, and why is it important is simply because in 2015, 193 governments of the world came and signed an agreement called Sustainable Development Goals, wherein the leaders of us, uh, our countries, actually took a very ambitious goal. And they said by 2030, there will be no poverty, no hunger, and uh, no inequity in this world. And so uh, the whole world is right now trying to wipe out uh, the curse of poverty and inequity from the face of the earth by 2030. Now, this has never happened in human history since the time Homo sapiens started, started walking straight. And that's very, very important and critical. So that means we have never seen a world without hunger, without poverty, without inequity ever. Uh, having said so, uh, it makes it very important that what plans do we have to contribute to that world? Now, we understand the world to change from uh, where it is today in a post environment where we are actually back to 2000, 2001 in terms of poverty and other issues, job losses, et cetera. Uh, I think uh, there is far more responsibility on people like us. And I therefore generally believe, and this is actually also an appeal to all those who are listening to us here, that the next 10 years will define humanity once again. And we are therefore fighting as a collective uh, world. And especially in Sanskrit, we have, we say, I mean, in India, we call the world as our family, Vasudev Kutambakam. Uh, I think it is very uh, important for us to actually genuinely believe and work as one global uh, entity to contribute towards eradication of poverty inequity in the next 10 years. With Avishkar, what we have decided is we will continue to work hard and try to convince at least $12 billion of global capital to join us in this fight. So Avishkar mm -hmm. go from 1.2 to $12 billion in assets under management uh, so that we can actually become at least some significant contributor in this fight. I, just to give you an idea, under the leadership of Paul Polman, the ex-CEO of Unilever, uh, I and along with 39 other commissioners, wrote a report called Better Business, Better World that actually defines the $2.5 trillion 
a year demand for bringing about a change uh, uh, to deliver sustainable development role. So roughly we are talking about $30 trillion that is needed to change the world. Uh, and when you look at $400 trillion of global, global capital, it's a very small. Uh, you're effectively talking 1% a year coming from there. So the $300 trillion if it contributes 1% 1, 1 every year, we should be able to change the world. Not a very, very difficult challenge in front of people like us. So if we can collectively put our might and thinking uh, and convince 1% of the global capital to participate, we can have 3 billion people who will actually be part of the economic cycle. And the world will be a very, like a Hindi movie, uh, people will live happily ever after. And that's really the ambition and that's the goal. Uh, that's a uh, fantastic, uh, Vinit. That's such a powerful uh, closing statement that, you know, how entrepreneurship, sustainability, impact, investing, and, you know, uh, 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 impacting over 3 billion people on the planet uh, helps. And that's really very, very encouraging. I hope that uh, uh, our audience and especially the entrepreneurs in our audience take uh, a lot of insights from this, build amazing businesses. And, uh, uh, you know, please consider uh, going with uh, Avishkar with your uh, first rounds of investment. Not only are they looking at uh, the investment, but also uh, supporting you through your journey. Vineet, thank you so much for uh, being here today. Uh, amazing insights, great comments. Uh, thank you very much from uh, myself and everyone here at TAI. Thank you and Namaskar. Hardik, over to you. Hello.